Welcome. Today we're going to talk about tips and best practices while working with Deluge. Our agenda. We're going to talk about syntax assist, script versioning, debugging, info and alert, and our try and catch functions. So we'll start with syntax assist. What is it and how can it help us? Well, within our Deluge editor, we get a cool feature called syntax assist. Working with different scripting languages, it can be sometimes confusing and hard to keep track of the syntax and how to properly write code. Well, with syntax assist, the editor allows us to make less mistakes by providing suggestions as we write our code. Keeping syntax assist on can be very, very productive as it will allow you not to make so many mistakes while helping you remember some of that syntax. Remember, keeping it on is always a good idea. Now let's talk about script versioning. Deluge Editor allows you to keep different versions of your script automatically for you. This way you don't have to worry about making changes on your scripts and then accidentally losing some information that you might have written days before. Uh, this way you can roll back and forth between different versions of your script and not have to worry about losing any information. This is a very neat, very good a feature that the editor for Deluge uh, provides to us. Now let's talk a little bit about debugging. So we have different tools uh, that are given to us by Deluge to help us debug or find errors within our code. We get the info and alert features. Info is used uh, within functions and alerts are used within workflows. You can info and alert out anything that holds a value. This includes variables, maps, lists, or collections. Now besides the info and alert features, we also get editor messages and we have the try catch blocks. So let's go a little bit into detail on these things. We're going to actually do some debugging so you guys can see how some of these tools that Deluge provides to us actually get applied. So let me switch over to this application. And we have it right here. It's the Zilker Home Appliances application. This application is meant to help the company keep track of orders and installation appointments for, for the company itself. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Uh, the engineer that was working on this application was trying to insert some mock data on the application to help the development and the testing for this application uh, go a lot smoother. Uh, but for some reason, the function that the engineer created is not working properly. So we were tasked with the job of looking at that application and debugging the function that he's currently working on. And we have it right here. So this is the function that has issues in it. And we're going to go through it and uh, do some debugging. Okay. So this is supposed to, like I said, get some mock data from a third party API and insert it into the application. If we go back to the application, you can see there's no data in there right now. And we have this report here for all the orders that's gonna help us see once uh, information actually gets entered onto here. So let's go back to the code and let's try and execute this code and see what happens. So we click execute and we get an, an error. This is an example of an editor message. Uh, here's telling us that there was an error on execution and the details just says that there's an internal exception on line 11. We do get a line number that can help us uh, get to the solution. So let's close this prompt here and go to line 11, see if we can figure this out. Uh, so it looks like we're trying to get a response into this variable from the API call. Um, this line here seems okay to me, semicolons there, uh, nothing that we see right away. So let's take a look at the URL on the line right above it. And by looking at it, I think what's happening here is that the key, uh, API key here, is not being passed. And if you look at line three, we do see that there is an API key that's being called from a different function. So let's go ahead and try passing that here and see if that fixes the issue, okay? Just 
All right, so we enter that on there. And let's go ahead and try and save and execute this code. All right, so when we try saving the code changes that we made, we actually get another error uh, message from the editor. And at this time it says, there's an error in line 10, okay? So it says that the variable API key is not defined. Uh, okay, so we look at line 10, that is the line that we're working on right now, and we entered API key, but when we go and look at line three, I can see where I made the mistake. So the API key variable has a capitalized K, and we entered it lowercase right here. So a variable names are case sensitive, and we need to make sure that we enter that correctly. Now, this actually takes me to another point. There's something called syntax, syntax assist, which if I would have taken advantage of, it would have helped us not make the mistake. So I just erased the variable, and I'm going to go ahead and start typing it out again. So I concatenate here, and I start typing API. And when you see me typing that, you see that small little uh, tip that comes out under that? That is what we call syntax assist. So if I were to just select that, it would actually type it out for us. So what the editor does is automatically kind of read our code and intelligently tell us, hey, this is a variable um, that we think you're trying to use here. And it gives us the option to automatically prefill it. So if I were to take advantage of that and now click on save, we see that the code actually saves correctly. All right, so let's go ahead and try executing now. All right, so we executed the code and we get the, the prompt that says execute it successfully. So we'll close it. We'll go back to our application and refresh this page. Great, so now we get some data. But I do see that the email column is actually blank and that should have some contact information on there, an email address. So there is obviously something still not quite working on here. So let's go back to our code and see if we can figure this out. All right, so the issue was with the email. All right, so let's see if we can find out where email is on here. All right, so we look at line 24, and we see this is where we get our email and insert the record with the email being pulled to the response in JSON, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do something. Let's go ahead and outside of that insert command, we're gonna use our info tool. We're gonna, this is our info command that's available to us. This helps us um, you know, debug and find out whether um, a piece of information is actually being uh, read correctly. So we'll start with the info command here, info. And what we'll, we're actually gonna info out is the second part of this um, this line here. We're going to copy this and we'll go ahead and paste it here. Don't forget our semicolon at the end. All right, and then we'll go ahead and save and execute. All right, and as you can see, it's given us a null result on here. So obviously that that's line that line is actually not pulling any information from the API call. So let's go ahead and close this. Um, now we go back to the application itself. We see that there is other columns with data that are being pulled correctly. So the phone, right? So let's go back to the code and right under the email info line that we created, let's create another info. But this time we're going to info out the phone number which is what we used up here on line number 16. So we'll copy this right here. And we'll, we'll put it here on the new info line that we created. All right, so now we go ahead and save and execute. All right, and we see that this, this does work. So there is data being pulled, but for some reason the email data is not. It's given us a null response. So let's close this and let's go ahead and what we'll do is we'll info out the entire response 
to see if there is in fact an email piece of data that's been uh, gathered and pulled from the API call. So here, going back to line 11, we're getting the response from that fetch command and we're putting it in this variable response, but then we're turning it into a list right here. So let's go ahead and return the list of data here. And we're gonna do that by infoing out the actual, uh, the variable with that, with that data. We'll info it out just like this. We're gonna put response list. And as you can see, it's actually given us that, the syntax assist has given us this, that option. So we'll enter it, we'll finish with a semicolon. We'll go ahead and save and execute this. And on the results, if we start going through it, we see that there is in fact a key pair value with email and the value with an actual email address. But as you can see, email, okay, it's, it's singular without a letter S, and I did notice that in our code, there you go, it has a letter S for emails. So let's go ahead and, and change it here on our, our info command. We'll remove the S, and we'll go ahead and save and execute. All right, and we actually see that that did solve our issue here. It, it does pull information out with with the email address. All right, so now what we have to do is we'll go ahead and just comment these two lines of code. We no longer need the info. Uh, we don't need the info with the response up here either. So we'll comment that out as well. And here on the actual code that uh, where it enters the email address to the records, let's go ahead and correct that and remove that letter S. So now that we actually corrected uh, that right here, we'll go ahead and save and execute once again. And this time when we execute, it should actually insert the correct record. So let's clo uh, close this prompt. Let's go back to our application and refresh. All right, and this time we actually do get the email column populated with those email addresses. So let's go actually go back to our dashboard all right, now as you can see now, the report here actually does have some data in there. Okay, so I think we did uh, we did great here. We used some of the tools available to us uh, from the Luge editor, and we we're actually able to debug this function. Um, so hopefully this was very educational for you, and you'll start using some of these debugging uh, features available to you through Deluge. Let's talk about using the info. When infoing out a collection of records, sometimes you might be surprised that you don't get quite the value that you were expecting. We have an example here. On the left side, we have a function that has a fetch command, you know, fetching some records from an inventory table. But then we info out the records that we think we're going to receive. And to our surprise, on the right side, we only get one result. That's the power of that info command. By using info, we get to see what we actually hold within certain variables. Now let's look at this, uh, at a solution for this. We have a function on the left side, same fetch, but in this time, what we're going to do is iterate through every single record in that collection variable with a for each loop. Now when we info out every single iteration, we can see that we get all the records on the right side. This is what we were expecting. That's what info provides for us. Now let's take it even a step further. Let's add some strings to the info command that would make it a little bit easier for us to read. Now we have a function on the left side, also doing a fetch records. We're also iterating through every single record on that collection variable. But this time, we're concatenating some strings to the info command. What this does, as you can see on the right side, is it, it gives us a way to read that information a little bit easier. Now we know what each piece of data that's being infoed out actually means. Using the info command is extremely helpful whenever you have a function that isn't executing as you expect it to. 
It can also help you find issues in your logic. It can help you break down conditional statements like the if and else statements. Whenever something's breaking and it's not properly functioning the way you expect it to. As an example, if you were to have a conditional statement with multiple if and then statements, you can put info commands in every block and that way realize which one or find out which section of that info uh, conditional statement is actually executing. This can be very, very, very uh, good for you to use. Now we also have our editor messages. If there are any syntax errors, the editor will prompt the user. Most of the time, the error messages are accurate. Sometimes they're vague. Now, the two most common problems are going to be misspelled variable names and missing semicolons. So make sure you look through your deluge code for those two common problems and clear those out first. Here's an example of an editor message. On the left side, we have a function, and we have a variable, and we're assigning a string to it. Now, when we info out the variable, we get an error at line number four. The error says variable, my name is not defined. Well, what happened here is that we misspelled the name of that variable when we info it out. So on the bottom right side, we can see the same code, but with the corrections made, and you can see that we no longer get the editor message. Let's look at this other example. We have a function with some Deluge code in there, and we have an editor message showing us an error at line number six. It says that there's an improper statement, and the error might be due to a missing semicolon at the end. Well, when you look at line number six, you can see that there is nothing that requires a semicolon. But if you look farther down on line number 19, you can see that there's a line of code that is missing a semicolon at the end. In this case, the Deluge editor was good about telling us there was an error, but was kind of vague when it came to tell us what it was. This is an example of some of those editor messages that we have to watch out for because they might not be 100% uh, correct. Now let's talk about our try and catch methods. What happens if your script keeps on executing after an error has occurred? Well, Deluge allows for error handling. And we use that through our try and catch method. On the screen, you can see an example of the syntax for our try catch uh, methods. Here's an example of the catch block catching an error. On the left side, we have some deluge code and we have our try and catch method. So we're fetching some information from the inventory table. Within the try method, we're actually trying to assign a value to our record. But because does not execute properly, we catch an error and we info it out. So you can see on the right side, we see where the catch method infos out the error. Now let's look at an example of the try block actually working. We have the same deluge code, we're fetching some information, and when we try to assign a new value to a record, in this case, the try block actually works. We don't catch any errors, and we actually execute what's inside the try block. You can see that on the right side there. All right, so a quick recap. We spoke about keep syntax assist on, how valuable that is when writing syntax, have the ability for the editor to help you uh, write the syntax properly. We spoke about script versioning. This allows for you to keep different versions of your script so you don't have to worry about deleting or making changes to your code. We talked about debugging and the Several options that are available to us with Deluge, like the info and alert features and our try and catch uh, blocks. Uh, so make sure that you use all these tools that are available to you. Make sure that you, you keep track of your code with script versioning and that you debug with the options that Deluge provides. Thank you. I hope that you found this very educational.